most World War II fans are very familiar with the Battle of Villers-Bocage in Normandy in France, where SS Oersteinführer Michael Wittmann wreaked havoc on a British armored column, destroying up to 14 tanks, two anti-tank guns, and 15 armored vehicles and transports in 1944. Wittmann was promoted to SS Habsteinführer and awarded the Eichenlauf mit Zwerten zum Ritterkreuz des Seelenkreuzes or the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross with oak leaves and swords. Three years before Wittmann's exploits, another extraordinary action took place in the outskirts of Leningrad, very close to Gatchina, south of Leningrad, in the Wojskowice state form. The panzers were advancing. The Soviet command was very concerned and threw everything they had from the reserves. The Kirovsky Zavod, or the Kirov plant, was one of two plants of the Soviet Union responsible for producing the heavy KV-1 tank, and it was very close to this front. Luckily enough for the Soviets, there was also an experienced commander available, and that was much harder to find than heavy machinery in those days of the summer of 1941. Zinovi Grigorievich Kolobanov had fought in the Winter War against Finland and had survived up to three burned tanks in three unsuccessful attempts to break the Finnish lines in Vipuri or Viborg. According to the Red Star journalist Arkady Fyodorovich Pinchuk, Kolobanov was awarded the title of the hero of the Soviet Union for breaking through the Mannheim lines, but this news is not confirmed. In early March of 1940, he received the Gold Star and the Order of Lenin, and he was promoted to the rank of captain. But because of fraternization of his crew with the Finnish soldiers, he was finally deprived of both the title and the award after the end of the Winter War. Now with the rank of Starship Lieutenant or Senior Lieutenant, he was transferred from the reserve to the 1st Tank Regiment of the 1st Heavy Tank Division in Leningrad. The commander of the tank division, General Mayor or Major General of the Armored Forces Viktor Ilyich Varanov wrote in his memoirs of the 8th of August this quote, after continuous battles near Pskov, Kingisep and Luga, the division approached the city of Krasnogvardiesk, which is now called Gatina, an important rail and road junction in the outskirts of Leningrad. The situation was extremely unfavorable for us. The units defending the line on the Luga River were cut off from the main forces. Others retreated to Leningrad in heavy fighting. The reserves sent from the rear guard have not yet arrived. The Nazis advanced in huge formation of tanks, trying to crush our troops and capture Krasnok Varadesk on the move. We used ambushes of heavy tanks, counting on the power of the Clement Voroshilov tank." Unquote. And this is exactly the situation at the beginning of our tale. Kolobanov's company was made up of five heavy KV-1 tanks. Kolobanov sent two tanks to the Luga road, and the other two to the Kingisab road. He placed himself in the middle, in the T, facing the road to the southwest. The road was narrow and had marshy and muddy terrain to the sides, so it was the only way to approach Gatina from the southwest. All the KV tanks were dug in the terrain, with only the turrets visible in custom-made earth caponiers. The turrets themselves were also camouflaged. In the afternoon of the next day, that is the 20th of August, Lieutenant F. Dokemienka and Juno Lieutenant Dektiar were the first to meet a German tank column on the Luga Road, knocking up to five enemy tanks and three armored personal carriers. Aerial reconnaissance did not reveal the Soviet positions to the Germans, so they sent a motorcycle reconnaissance squad. Kolobanov let it pass unharmed without revealing his position. Finally, the main German panzer column appeared right in front of Kolobanov's position. Up to 22 Czech Skoda Panzerkampfwagen 35Ts were marching the narrow road straight towards Kolobanov's location. When the leading tank reached a prepared landmark on the road, Kolobanov gave the order, and I quote, First landmark, on the head, direct shot under the cross, armor piercing, a gun! Fire! A gun! The gunner was also a veteran both from Finland and Poland, 
and an artillery instructor. He obeyed the orders. Soon the first three tanks in the column were knocked out, and fire was transferred to the last tank in the column in order to block the movement of all the tanks in between. The Germans still did not know where the fire was coming from, or how many tanks, anti-tank guns or enemy troops were firing on them. They did not know it was only one heavy KV-1 tank. The Panzerkampfwagen 35Ts tried to escape the road. They bumped into each other. They pulled over to the side of the road and fell into a swamp, where having completely lost their mobility, they were just sitting ducks for Kolobanov's experienced tank crew. The carnage continued as the panzers were put out of action and some burned when Kolobanov's shots hit the tank's ammunition rack. But they finally located the KV-1 and now started firing furiously at Kolobanov. But the 37mm gun could do nothing against the KV-1's turret armor of 75mm and 15 degrees inclination. After only one hour of combat, Kolobanov had used all of his 98 armor-piercing shells and had knocked out all the 22 Panzer Ts in the column. As for the German fire, 114 shells hit Kolobanov's turret, but none pierced it. After this battle, Kolobanov changed his location, but was spotted by Panzerkampfwagen force. These Panzers had a better gun, of similar caliber of 75mm against the KV's 76mm gun, but the Panzer's gun had a short barrel and its shells had very little penetration. So after an exchange of fire at long range, there was no significant result for either side. Nevertheless, Kolobanov's sights were destroyed and the turret was jammed. Kolobanov had to leave his dug in position and move his whole tank in order to target the enemy tanks. We will see a similar maneuver again by German Michael Wittmann later in the war on the Eastern Front, manning a Stumgeschütz assault gun. But now back to Gatchina. At the end of the day, Kolobanov had destroyed up to 22 tanks out of a total of 43 panzers knocked out by his company of 5 heavy KV-1 tanks. The higher estimates of hits on Kolobanov's tank raised the number to 156 German hits on the turret. Kolobanov said years after the battle, and I quote, I regret that I can't describe the fight more consistently. After all, the commander is looking through the crosshairs of the site. Everything else was a continuous sound of explosions and the shouting from my crew, Hurra! It's on fire! The sense of time was completely lost. How long the fight lasted, I had no idea." Unquote. Josef Barisovich Spiller, called by the Germans the Bandit Spiller, another tank commander who participated in this battle, said, and I quote, When I informed the division headquarters of the defeat of the fascist tank column, they did not believe it at first. The commander of the tank division, Baranov, ordered me to repeat the message, and after the battle personally come to headquarters with a written report." End of quote. Strangely enough, the Germans have no reports whatsoever on this battle. Soviet sources claim that it was such a shameful battle that it was either erased or ignored. Soviet sources also claimed there was a change of commanders in the 6th Panzer Division from General Lieutenant Franz Langdar to Oberst Eckhard Raus. German sources also show he indeed took command of the 6th Panzer Division, but much later at the end of 1941, and just because Langdar was ill. Later in May of 1942, Langdar assumed command of the 155th Reserve Panzer Division in France. So we can safely assume he had not been punished in France, but was really sick and recuperated for service. Up to 14 tanks of the 65th Tank Battalion were indeed reported by the Germans as irretrievable losses in the period of the 23rd of August to the 4th of September of 1941. So my own personal conclusion is that even though Kolobanov achieved a great victory, the real effects were not so great. The Panzerkampfwagen 35T was a great light tank, but completely obsolete by 1941. Just as obsolete as the Soviet BT-5s and BT-7s, 
Moreover, many of the panzers were repaired, as the German original reports show, and they were repaired because the Germans won the main battle and the day. The 20th of August, Gatchina fell to the Germans despite Kolobanov's incredible feat. A combination of lack of coordination and communication and pure negligence made this victory useless and the town fell to the advancing panzers. With the German tanks fighting in the outskirts of Gatchina, the local authorities tried to communicate and ask for orders from the Leningrad military region, but the cables of the communication switchboard had been cut because of nerves and pure negligence, and the head of the district department of the NKVD decided to evacuate the town, leaving Gatchina to the Germans. A week later, the NKVD head was sentenced to death, and all the local party bosses were given long prison sentences. As for Kolobanov, he went on to fight and defend the outskirts of Leningrad, but was seriously wounded in the retreat from the city of Pushkin in September of 1941. Kolobanov recuperated from his wounds in 1945 and continued a successful military career until his death in 1994 in Minsk, Belarus. I personally got a few important points from this story. The first is that experience is extremely important. The second that knowledge of the terrain and preparation always give an enormous advantage. The third is that superior equipment sometimes makes up for numbers, but not always. And last, individual and heroic actions are great and we all like them, but if the leadership is inept, no amount of heroism can make up for negligence and incompetence. I do hope you liked this episode. Please comment, share, like and subscribe as it is vital for the channel. And if you didn't like it, thank you so much anyway for watching this far.